I guess we're ready to go here. Any questions about anything? So we're now to the second part of mobile services, um, and this uses SAML. SAML is security search and markup language. It is, like all the markup languages derived from XML, like HTML and other languages, it is just a way of formatting data to send it over the network. And this is just a way of formatting security assertions like, I have administrator rights, I have limited rights, I have permission to enter this folder. So in itself, it's just a language. Um, that's the game here. So you send, a, first you have to connect to an identity provider and provide them some credentials, like a password. Then they decide you're allowed to have some privileges and um, send that information with the SAML to the service provider saying, okay, let this person have some privileges, like getting this email account or getting this folder. Uh, this is the same general principle that leads to a lot of problems of single sign-on. Now, Microsoft's claim is that the weaknesses in the Microsoft Active Directory system are inevitable. And here is their argument. I'm not qualified to say whether it's entirely true or not. But what they say is, you either have to keep making the user log in over and over again as they access different servers, or you have to give them some kind of token, and then that token is sent, and they now believe that they know who you are. And that's what single sign-on does. And they say it is an inevitable feature of single sign-on that there should be some token flying around which could be stolen and reused. Now, it seems to me that through the miracle of public key cryptography, that is absolutely not true. You could use Diffie-Hellman Exchange to prove that you know something without transmitting it over the wire in any usable way. But in any case, that's Microsoft's argument. And the, the attack they're trying to explain away is the pass the hash attack. In Microsoft operating in domains, you can steal password hashes without reversing them and use them to authenticate all over the system. Anyway, so here's the use cases for SAML. The most simple one, like I say, you log in once in the morning and you don't have to keep logging in again and again throughout the day at your company server. It has stored somehow information about who you are, which it transmits somehow to all the devices that need it. Then there's federated identity, where you actually have other companies agree to accept your token. And uh, the case I learned about at the Microsoft trainings I went to was um, uh, ADP, the prints the payroll checks for almost every company in America, Ross Perot's company, at least it was at one time, and um, originally, all the Microsoft employees had to go make an account at ADP with another name and password, and then log in there to see their payroll stubs. And finally, Microsoft gave them a federated identity management server so that they could receive signals from Microsoft domain controller telling ADP, don't ask this guy for a password. I already know who they are, and they logged in over here. And that is a valuable thing, although obviously there are some risks. Anyway, then there's web service security. Um, you can protect web services with the same thing if you like. I'm sending language, these SAML messages up. So here's how it would look. The user tries to get to a protected resource, like they try to open your Facebook page to see your Facebook um, panel. Then it says, OK, um, you, if you want to make authorization, you're going to have to redirect over to the identity provider server. Send to get up here. I will now send a challenge to you, like here's eight digits, add these eight characters to your password, hash the result, and send the hash over the wire, some kind of system like that. Then you log in, then it sends you a signed response in HTML, which gives you an authentication token, which you can now send up here. So it's not that different than OAuth that we were talking about last time. So uh, that's the redirect that tells you, I would let you see that page, but you haven't logged in, so you have to first go talk to the authentication server before I'm going to let you see things. And then you're going to come back to me with a SAML assertion, which is going to convince me that you did successfully log in at that other system. So obviously, it is tempting to imagine that there might be some way to forge that SAML response, where you did not actually pass the test at the identity provider, but somehow you trick it into believing you. And of course, that's what happens. So here's threats. If two systems were to collude, they could lie and, uh, to others. And you could, of course, have XML attacks that would bring down the servers with things like XML entity expansion, like we talked about before. You could have man-in-the-middle attacks. Unless these things are using a system with a trusted third party, like HTTPS, that anybody could sit in the middle and intercept these responses and modify them or reuse them. Um, and then you can have replay attacks. If you have not considered this in the design of your tokens, this is like cookie replay, which works on almost everywhere on the internet. Um, you could tie a cookie to just one device with some number that's just on the device. But if you don't remember to do that, and the same cookie can be used on another device, like Dropbox. Anybody can steal your Dropbox token and put it on another computer. And now they get a copy of all your Dropbox stuff, and you'll never know that's happened. All right, and then there's session hijacking, of course. If you can predict the session identifiers, then I don't even need to impersonate your login. I can just impersonate you. After you log in, I then send uh, requests to the server that are added into your session, and it believes I'm continuing your requests. 
Um, there's also section fixation, which is a trick because what you can do is you can forge this re reply here. So you tell them to go log in, and if the, um, say, the session identifier, like their session number, which should be a random number from zero to billions, I, maybe I can specify it here, and that number is used down here, so I could force you to use a certain number, which is a number that I'm already using for my session. So the server already knows I'm number 1,000. I trick you into using number 1,000, and that makes it easier for me to hijack your session. That's called session fixation, when I am able to change the supposedly random number you use to a controlled number. All right, so you change your SAML assertion. Um, now, there should be a signature in the XML. Signatures sound great. In practice, they have a lot of holes in them. Um, I was... I learned about this about four years ago when I went to B-Sides, and this guy was talking about how to alter Microsoft signed executables. And I said, wait a minute, how can you alter a signed executable? And the answer is that the file has about seven parts, and only four of the parts are signed, and the rest is important, and you can just change that part, which is the way it usually is. Anyway, so if there are implementation bugs that weaken the signature validation, then you can trick it. And one cute trick is XML signature wrapping. The way this works is, you just modify it to SAML assertion. Like you modify the subject portion to say that you're the administrator. And I think I got a picture. Here we go. So here's the structure of a SAML response. It's just a bunch of XML things. You have an assertion, which is signed, which says like your ID is somebody. Then you have a signature. Then you have signed info and a reference. And down here you have a URI. These are just different parts of the assertion. And to us, of course, the important part is that ID equals somebody. That tells it that I believe who you are. Um, now, the problem is just simple logic. The business logic processing model went this way. It checked to see if it's signed, extracts the assertion, and verifies it. And then it made two passes through. First, it made a pass through to verify the signature. Then later on, it makes a pass to actually use the information. And it did not compare the two to make sure that the information interpreted by the module that uses the data is equal to what was interpreted by the module that verified the signature. So the simplest attack is just to remove the signature. This actually worked on two large products. They weren't apparently really valid. This is um, quite common, actually, and we had to talk about this in the web hacking class. It's quite often they make an authentication system that fails open. If you just give it an invalid password, it lets you through. And here's the game. If the signature is missing, it will just flow through the code. So that's a simple answer. Another one that's even more fun is you have several assertions. Now, this one here only has one assertion. It says ID equals pound some ID. But you could have more assertions, and it turns out a bunch of them only verified the first one. So the uh, verification module just checked to make sure the first one was signed. Then the one that actually used them would implement them all. So you could just add extra ones after the signed one, and they'll be believed. And a bunch of systems, including the IBM system, are vulnerable to that attack. Uh, this is... This sounds kind of ridiculous, but this is the way it always is with all security products. The first generation is ridiculous. Like, um, encrypted USB sticks. When people became aware of the fact that anybody could just steal the USB stick, they sold encrypted USB sticks. And there were companies like Iron Key that sold expensive USB sticks that were really encrypted. There were a bunch of cheap discount models, and most of them just added a piece of software that made you log in to see the contents of the stick, but they didn't actually encrypt the data. So if you plug it into a Windows machine, a box will come up and ask you to log in. But if you plug it into a Linux machine and just use DD to suck off the data, it's all right there. Because that of course, this probably, they probably felt like they were addressing the need because an average person who picks one up off the ground and doesn't know anything and plugs it in will find they need the password. So let's say we protected your data, and indeed they have put an obstacle in front of your data to some extent, but not as much as they claimed on the box. It's not actually encrypted. And this is well, almost all security products. The first generation is like this. It's very lame, um, and it takes cycles of humiliation and repair before they actually start doing it right. So yeah, here's the example of that. You've got, um, you have one assertion here that is signed, and you just add another assertion here. The signature is all verified down here, so it passes the verification module, but when you make a second pass through to enforce it, it enforces both of them, and so you end up sneaking a security statement that is not approved into it, like you're the administrator. All right, so there are only two systems that weren't vulnerable, Microsoft and Simple SAML. I just think this is something, uh, it was difficult for me to start saying this five years ago, but now I've gotten used to saying the Microsoft product is the more secure solution. You know, Microsoft has been spending the last 10 or 12 years improving their security. Yeah, it's up to 15 years now, and they're no longer a joke. 15 years ago, Microsoft was a joke about security, and they figured that out and decided to reform, and they really are pretty careful these days. 
They still make mistakes like everybody else, but they're not just ridiculously out of date and not even trying like they used to be. Anyway, all right, uh, so the, um, the simple SAML thing, this actually would um, just extract each assertion into a separate statement and verify each one, which is a fine way to do it. It made sure that any assertion that was going to be used was actually verified first. So those things are called XML signature wrapping, um, and the only countermeasure for available is patch your stuff as they fix those problems. So which one is a server that can verify your password? <laughs> all right, so that is the identity provider, second one there, whoa, all over the place. But the identity provider is the one that can verify passwords. The other ones have different purposes. Which attack requires two attackers working together? All right, and that is, of course, collusion. Good, all right. Which one can you perform by adding assertions to the response? All right, they call that XML signature wrapping. You add extra XML outside the part that's signed. All right, which one harms authorized users but doesn't allow unauthorized users in? All right. All right, and that, that's, of course, denial of service. It prevents people from using it, but it does not actually mean anybody gets in anybody's account and steals data but it's still something you'd like to avoid. All right, uh, now, you may remember Java used to have a runtime client in your browser that was extremely vulnerable. It was a wide open door to every computer for years, and pretty much people have given up using it. And, but of course, everyone continues to use Java on servers, and the reason is you can save so much money because you don't have to write your app over and over again for different platforms. So it is a big deal to have a platform development framework that lets you cross, for example, Android and iOS. So they're both using WebView to display the uh, content in the browser. And if you want, there are cross-platform development frameworks like HTML5 and JavaScript bridges. And there's a ton of these new JavaScript-based frameworks like Node.js. And I'm sort of frustrated by all the hacking competitions because I can't figure out how to hack those things. I'm really going to have to like, take a class or something. There's a bunch of things all based on JavaScript. And you just have to know what all the config files are and what they mean to figure out how to hack them. Anyway. So um, you've got URI schemes. Now, you already know there's HTTP and HTTPS. And there's other ones like Telnet. Um, a lot of operating systems have designed others, these proprietary schemes. And these things turned out to be a, a wealth of vulnerabilities on phones and in browsers. So Tel, for example, on your phone will dial, launch a dialer for the phone call. And you can make a, a link inside a web page that will call the Tel method that will dial the phone. Now, in early stages, in early versions, you could uh, Actually, in this one, I think, never had that vulnerability. Both of them would not directly dial the phone. They would pop up a box to require a user to verify. So you couldn't make a web page that made a phone call. And so on iOS, it will pop up a box here saying cancel or call. And like I say, you could just put it in a web frame. You could put it in something that automatically loads like an iframe, and now it will automatically try to dial that number. But the operating system saves you as a second layer of security where it will not act directly call. It will just pop up a box asking the user if you want to call. And on Android, it's the same, it pops up, but it doesn't take the call unless you hit that call button. You can define custom URI schemes. It is one way to allow signals to move around on the device, so you can, this is an inter-process communication method, and it's quite popular, there are 600 of them. So, if you, you can make an app, or even a web page, that will invoke these things, and that's uh, similar to cross-site request forgery. This means your web page can launch the services of an app that uses a custom URI scheme, and they might not have thought of that. They might have assumed that only their products are going to be using it. 
So you can send an email or an SMS, be one way to do it, continuum analysis URL, get someone to click on it. The URL is not HTTP or HTTPS, it's something else. Or you can use cross-site scripting or other methods to do it. And one famous example was Skype. Skype operated this way in 2010. So you would have Skype colon phone number, and since it was not the native telephone dialing system, it did not go have the operating system protecting you, and Skype would immediately call as soon as you executed this Skype URL. So you could make a malicious page that trick people into making a Skype call. Um, all right, and here's even more fun. There are these special codes you can dial that do special things. Like a star 69 tells you who just called you, and there's other ones that tell you your phone number and your account balance and all this jazz. Here's a fun one. It resets your voicemail password. So if you can send these externally, like in a web page, you can reset someone's voicemail password and even more. Um, you can type this in your browser. This is one. This thing will dial. This will display your IMEI number. Tell star percent 2309 percent 23. Um, so these are, uh, that's relatively harmless, but the, some of these you can do it because of the tell, but you can, you can activate these directly on some devices. This thing here would do a factory reset on Samsung devices as soon as they view that page. So that's good, clean fun. It's not as fun as them blowing them up, but anyway, the, um, and so in Android, you use intents primarily for these things, but you can also declare custom URI schemes, and uh, that makes them available to every app on the device unless you have adjusted the Android exported to prevent it. So. Uh, new activity could define, could send an SMS. So here it's going to define down uh, here, and I think Android is spelled wrong, anyway, some app. You can define this thing called some app, that's a scheme, and now anything that starts some app colon will be received by this, so it can take some action based on that request. So here's a malicious page to send an SMS if you have an app that's vulnerable. So you have some app. And now you send it a message, hello world, going to that number. And when someone views this page, it sends the SMS, if that app is vulnerable. All right, so if you want to present these things, um, you have to restrict access to the component by Android exported. That would be one thing to do. The other thing is perform input validation. This is the same as before. Uh, input validation is a pretty weak defense, but it's really all you've got. Uh, if you're going to open up a custom URI scheme, then anybody can feed things in. And if it's on Android, it will be quite easy for those to be malicious, other apps attacking your apps, so you have to be careful. Of course, you can uh, also restrict it to with the signature, so only apps from your company can use this, and that's another option. You can have a suite of apps that work together, but don't let other ones in. Anyway, uh, they also have custom URI schemes on iOS, and you'll see them in info.plist. Um, here's how it would look in some app. CF, CF bundle URL schemes is some app define that thing. So an app defines a handle that opens a new file. You can trick it into visiting, a, you know, you've tricked someone into visiting a hostile web page and this will now create a file. Path equals temp lulls, content equals own. This would create a file on your phone if the app has the ability to create a file. And any app can make a file in the temp folder. So that's one simple example. All right, so again, you want to prevent this input validation on the signals that come in to make sure they're not doing unexpected malicious things. <coughs> And there is another um, more recommended modern way to do this. Instead of handle open URL, use open URL. And then you can specify what uh, legal sources are for the signal. So you just don't take a signal from anybody again. Um, these are all uh, segmentation defenses where you have some trusted zone and you prevent things from coming in that aren't coming in, that aren't within what you consider trusted, which is, again, one of those pretty weak defenses. Um, you may notice, in general, these are it would be nice. Cryptographic defenses are very strong. Things like input validation and defining a trusted zone are very weak, but that's what you get. All right, and then there's JavaScript bridges. Um, like I say, JavaScript is really taking over as super important, all these modern JavaScript-based frameworks, uh, which I think is entirely because of a decision of Chrome about six years ago. They noticed how lousy JavaScript was in Internet Explorer, and they said, why is JavaScript so slow? And they looked, and it was just coded badly, and they made JavaScript 100 times faster in Chrome. And that started a race. And everybody made JavaScript run super fast, and then it became possible to really use a lot of JavaScript, which was not possible before that. And I remember when I went to uh, the Chrome Developers Conference about three years ago, they had a, 
a whole session about developing cool apps for the browser, and they would always start and say, well, of course, you can only run this in the advanced browsers. And the advanced browsers is everything except IE, because IE was still 100 times slower. But I think Microsoft was shamed into upping their game. So anyway, um, so you can, now Android and iOS apps are rendered with WebView. So here's code that will show Google's web page on Android, coming in through, uh, that's the code that does it. It'll set JavaScript enabled and load a URL with um, JavaScript. So you can adjust the WebView settings, and you can choose to expose native functionality to the web page through JavaScript. Now, this will mean you can write JavaScript that runs apps and mixes apps, and mixes apps together and stuff, and that's cool, but of course that means you can now run apps with things like cross-site scripting attacks and inter-process communication, all these, all the typical web attacks will now run apps on the phone. So it's pretty dangerous, but it's so cool people like to use it. So here's the add JavaScript interface. This will let you put Java objects into WebView and allow JavaScript to call the methods of your Java objects. And now you can run the features of your app through the browser. Um, and that's the game now you're now malicious web pages will be able to get inside the app and get its data and use its functionality, which could well get you in trouble. Now browsers, you have this thing called the same origin policy, and this is kind of hilarious. Same origin policy and VLANs are things that came out and were trumpeted as security measures, then immediately everybody found a way to exploit them and hop around, and then the manufacturers tried to say, oh, they were never intended to be security measures. And in fact, that's all there is. But the same origin policy is the main security measure in a browser. And it is a very disturbing thing. There's a, at this college, there's a bunch of forms. They would like us to fill out simple questions like, how many students are in your class? Well, it turns out nobody knows how many students are in a class. Some of you actually show up. Other people don't show up and take the test. Other people don't do anything. And yet they come in two months late and say, I want to catch up. I couldn't answer this question. Nobody can answer this question. How many students are there in your class? So a simple other question is, what domain are we viewing on this web page? It says Microsoft.com at the top. Does that really mean we're at Microsoft.com or not? That's not a simple question either. And there's really so many ways to fool the browser so it gets confused about where it is that it's an issue. And one of the many ways is JavaScript. Um, if you inject an object into JavaScript, this, there's another, this can allow JavaScript to write to the file system. And 30% of Androids use this even though the documentation tells you not to use it. It is sort of contradictory to provide a feature and then put in the documentation, don't use this feature. But anyway, uh, that's cute. This is what happened to Microsoft. When Microsoft in Windows 98 tries to integrate Internet Explorer with Windows Explorer, it became possible to re refer to objects in the file system from the browser. And a bunch of attacks came from that. And this is the same kind of thing. If the browser can actually browse local files on the system, you're asking for trouble. Um, and so that's uh, prior to Android 4.2, none of them are safe. You can write an ARM executable and execute it in the charge data directory. You could root the device in principle through the browser and break out of the sandbox and do anything. So that's pretty good clean fun. Be fun to try that out. So reflection is a form of self-modifying code. And I used to write this stuff back in the 70s in assembly language. Back then, the assembler was very limited, although it's actually still the same. I was just going through attacks in the exploit development class, and the commands you need are not there, and you have to use like three or four assembly language commands. So anyway, all, code that alters itself is often a powerful way to do things fast, but it's very dangerous and confusing. And it means you can't print out the code, and it's hard to audit the code. Um, so reflection is one version of this, where you can write a self-modifying code. And um, again, that was uh, somewhat ameliorated in 2014, where they added this thing called a Add JavaScript Interface to load trusted content, uh, rather than using self-modifying code, where code reflects back on itself. So here's another countermeasure which would limit bridging. Uh, and that would, but of course, this reminds me of a lot of features. The way to be safer is to not use the convenience feature, which you want to use because it'll save you money. So, of course, no one's going to go for that. But anyway, um, bridging JavaScript and Java together is intrinsically dangerous, but it provides a lot of functionality. So I think most companies have the reasonable attitude that if it makes a better product, we're going to do it. You security engineers just work harder to fix the problems. That's only kind of fair. Anyway. Uh, so you can exploit this thing by the should intercept request. Um, you can override this function, and now um, an app can use reflection to acquire an instance of an object. And therefore, it can run Java code on there, which is part of an app, and eject parameters into the Java code. So if your app has the ability to write a file, the web page can now use that functionality to write a file, dial the phone, erase things, do whatever your app can do. Um, 
So here's an example that writes to the SD card. It calls this sum app, and then it just has parameters here, which will then execute it. So it's going to be the C, instead of pointing to the command, instead of being a typical command line command, there's now a Java Lang runtime, and then that. So it's going to run Java from there. It takes the Java code accessible like images are in your website. All right. So if you want to prevent these things, of course, it's just the same old stuff. Don't, don't expose the functionality to the whole world. Use input validation and output encoding to limit malicious apps coming in and out. Um, and uh, try avoiding exposing this reflection to work on untrusted input. So you're hearing the same thing all the time. And if you took the uh, web development uh, web server hacking class, they said the same thing, which sounded very unrealistic to me. They said, your designer of the module here needs to know not only that module, but understand the module that feeds into it and the module that uses the data coming out of it and make sure not to send evil things out or accept evil things in. And that seemed to me to be placing a very high burden on a poor developer who probably only really knows like one thing and doesn't really want to learn other things. Um, but that is what you'd have to do to be safe. Realistically, I think that would be a separate team auditing the code rather than your original developers really understanding not only their product, but the products, their dependencies, and things that go after them. That's asking an awful lot. But that is the way to be safe. So iOS doesn't support explicit JavaScript bridges, but you can define should start load with request method, and that can get an instance of a class. So it does have some ability to execute portions of apps from web pages. And it can use that in the code. So you can, do, you can do this to some extent on iOS. And here's an exploit code that will add records to a SQLite database from inside a web page. So you get someone views this web page. It now uh, runs this some app custom uh, URI scheme, which then refers to an object and executes a query and now inserts into a table some data. We an insert. Anyway, so it's, it's in principle possible to write an app that would expose this code and then have it be maliciously exploited. Uh, this is not subverting the OS at its fundamental basis, like allowing you to jailbreak it, but it is a possibility that your app would be vulnerable to attack from the web if you use this functionality. Um, <coughs> all right, so again, the same old thing. Um, input, input validation and output encoding is easy for a security expert to say and very hard for a developer to really understand and implement. I must say, Dan Kaminsky is, I think, the strongest advocate for not wasting people's time with this kind of recommendation. He said, don't tell developers to learn security. Instead, build a version of their development environment that puts it in automatically. And that is what Microsoft did. Microsoft modified C with a bunch of parameter adjustments and different um, replacement submodules and such. So they, and they published that stuff about three years ago. They had a, their version of C that won't have so many problems if you use it. And that is probably a lot more realistic to fix the language than to expect all your developers to suddenly be a whole lot more careful about stuff they don't understand and don't want to understand. They've already got enough work. Anyway, uh, there's Mozilla wrote something called the Rhino JavaScript Bridge. And this was another way to do the same thing. You write everything in JavaScript, and then it can interact with your Java ab abjects directly. So you can do anything you want. Um, these are all repeating the same kind of mistake that Microsoft did with ActiveX. They made this way to have compiled code run in Internet Explorer that could do anything. You could run Windows Update, runs in ActiveX. You can write to the file system, write the system files, format the drive, send emails. And ultimately, that turned out to be a pretty poor functionality to build into a browser. But that's the game here. So again, it's convenient, but insecure. So if you use Rhino, you have to sandbox your code you can whitelist inputs to some extent so you limit which functions are permitted to enter your uh, Rhino JavaScript bridges, but it's not easy. And of course, that means people probably won't do it much. What is that prefix, like Skype? What do you call that? All right, that's a URI scheme, Universal Resource Indicator, or Uniform Resource Indicator, one of those. All right. A special phone number like that, what do you call that? I'm pretty sure those things are USSDs, but I forgot what it stands for. Let me flip back.
There we are. Young Structured Supplementary Service Data. Oh, that's not so bad. All right, that's what they are, USSDs. Those codes that do something on your phone, like reset your password. I imagine the popular answer is right, and so it is. All right. A class that modifies itself at runtime. What's that? Now, in the malware analysis class, according to those guys, Microsoft got so fed up with this, and so did Linux people, they implemented something called W or X. So this could never happen. RAM has to be either writable or executable. You cannot be executing stuff that can also be changed because they got so fed up with this. Yeah? Uh, even if that's the case, there's always pointers that can be changed. So, like, for example, in Objective-C that Apple uses, uh, all of the classes have functions, but you can change them by basically changing the pointer to go to wherever your function is. Yes, and, and the hardware does permit you to declare regions writable and executable. It's just they try to prevent it, but there is an option. Well, That's something some malware does. Even if you have that, though, there are calls that happen to pointers that are in an area that is not executable. Right. It doesn't use the data. Right, so you redirect it elsewhere. Yeah, that's right. So there's ways to work around it. It's a good point. That's like, that's hooking. All right, anyway, this is reflection. is one of the many uh, versions of self-modifying code. And self-modifying code tends to violate a whole lot of assumptions security people make. Uh, they file up, you can't run them through IDA Pro and see what they got, you know, so it's, it's in general a terrible idea. Um, it's rather like letting users share logins. So when you're going through a log later to find out who stole the money, more than one person is using the same name. That's why you're not allowed to do it if you take credit cards. VCI compliance requires that you cannot share logins. Everybody has to always log in as who they really are, so you have a real log of who did what. And if you're gonna let code modify itself, you enter the world of madness pretty fast, trying to decide, do I like what this code is doing? Has it passed my test? How do I know if it's going to modify later? All right, which one is Mozilla's product? Oh, I had one anyway. This is life. All right. Uh, well, that's Rhino. They're Rhino JavaScript Bridge. Somebody up there likes beating animals, so. All right, what's the popular Android feature that you're not supposed to use? All right, it's either B or D, and I gotta flip back to make sure. It's B, okay, so you go back, with. The thing you're not supposed to use was uh, yeah there add JavaScript interface is what's cool but they of course tell you not to use it so it's B thank you all right good okay good all right well uh, let's see who won and then I'll of course go up to the lab to help anybody who wants help up there